In this lesson, we're going to make sure that you really understand what an agonist is, because we're going to be talking about agonists all the way through this chapter. But also, we're going to be comparing that to what else can happen at that receptor, for instance, partial agonists, antagonists, and inverse agonists. And as a really broad overview, medications can generally be considered agonists, where they bind to the receptor and then cause the same physiological response as the natural ligand, or they can be considered antagonists, where they bind to the receptor, don't cause that physiological response, and just block that receptor and prevent the natural ligand from going onto that receptor. And just remember, as we're talking about agonists and antagonists, inverse agonists, and so forth, we're talking about cellular receptors. What can happen at cellular receptors? In two chapters, we're going to be talking about enzymes, and there we talk about enzymatic inhibitors. So an inhibitor has to do with enzymes, and the agonists and antagonists always has to do with the cellular receptor. And let's take a closer look at what happens with our medications as they bind to a receptor. Using the simplest type of cellular receptor as an example, the ligand-gated uh, ion channel. Recall that the ligand, the natural substance for which the receptor is made, can bind to the receptor because of its shape. But the shape is not the only factor involved in the binding. It really has to do more with the molecular forces. Remember that there's various molecular forces like van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, ion bonding. All of those are most important in the binding and the conformational change that occurs in order for th other things to happen in that cell. In this example, the ligand-gated ion channel, this portion of the molecule pulls together, opening up a channel and allowing calcium or other ions from the outside of the cell to travel through the channel into the cell. A full agonist for that receptor is a substance that does exactly the same as the natural ligand, opening up that gate to 100% of its capability. Notice how in this case, that strong ion bond was the thing that was responsible to pull the protein, to change the protein from its original structure to the new structure, and that resulted in the gate opening. What do you think would happen if a drug shaped the same way with the same molecular bonds was a little bit larger, maybe just too large to allow the gate to fully open. In that hypothetical case, the molecule would probably be a partial agonist. Partial agonists don't reach 100% of the effect that the natural ligand did, even if all of the receptors are bound. Now, looking at the full agonist again, what do you think would happen if you had a drug that was shaped in the exact same way with the same attractant bonds in this corner, but you didn't have that strong ionic bond that allowed this portion of the protein to fold up the way that it did with the normal ligand? In that hypothetical case, the drug would probably be the opposite end of the spectrum. It would have no physiological effect on the receptor, and it would be termed an antagonist, or sometimes called a blocker. So using the same analogy as the ion-gated receptor, the antagonist may be exactly the same shape as the natural ligand or the agonist, but it may be missing something like the ion bonding that results in the conformational change of the protein. In this case, it binds to the same spot as the original ligand, but it doesn't open up the gate. That is a competitive antagonist. 
if there's large amounts of the antagonist, it makes it much less likely that the ligand is going to bind to that receptor. The final possibility I want to discuss is an inverse agonist, and this is a bit more complicated. If you want to simplistically remember what an inverse agonist is, it's basically an antagonist with a little bit of an extra benefit. But it'd be good to try to fully understand what an inverse agonist is. Normally, when a receptor is not bound, it is functionally silent. Nothing is happening at the receptor. The protein is not causing those flow-on effects that you would normally expect if it was bound. Apply this to our ion channel receptor, and when the receptor is not bound, the gate is fully closed. No ions are coming through that channel. But some receptors display what we call a constitutive activity. And that means that there's a little activity that occurs just because of the fact that the receptor protein is there on the cell surface. This constitutive activity doesn't occur at every receptor protein. And it doesn't normally occur at this type of receptor, but for simplicity's sake, let's continue using this receptor as the example. An inverse agonist inhibits that constitutive activity. So if you want to remember it simplistically, just think of the inverse agonist as being an antagonist with some extra benefits. There are some genetic disorders, however, that will only respond to the inverse agonist. We've just used the simplest cellular receptor to understand what our medications can do at cellular receptors and to further our understanding of molecular binding of drugs at the cellular receptors. Quickly applying our knowledge to the most common and most complex cellular receptor, the G-protein-linked receptor, an agonist is a drug that acts in the same way as the natural ligand, ultimately resulting in the same cellular response. An antagonist blocks the receptor and that prevents the natural ligand from binding and prevents the cellular response that would occur with ligand binding. And an inverse agonist would only be possible if the particular receptor exhibits what we call some constitutive activity. In other words, if that receptor is involved in some cellular response simply by being on the cell surface.